Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us for another segment. We're going to be speaking with returning guest, Dr. Bruce Sands. He's returning to speak about the Vega Phase 2A Proof of Concept Study. Welcome back, Dr. Sands. How are you? Doing well. Thank you so much. Well, there are listeners who may not recognize you as a contributor. Give us a bit of your professional background. Uh, tell us what it is that you specialize in and where you are practicing. Yes, sure. I, I'm a gastroenterologist. I'm the chief of the division of gastroenterology at Mount Sinai in New York, a large healthcare system, but also very well known over the decades for its work in the inflammatory bowel diseases, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease. And I've been involved in clinical trials and clinical research of IBD for approximately 24, 25 years. When it comes to ulcerative colitis, uh, I heard you mention that. How does that impact a person's life? What is it and what type of difficulty should one expect? Yes, well, ulcerative colitis is a chronic inflammatory condition of the large bowel by definition. Uh, It can involve any proportion of the bowel, though it typically involves the uh, distal part of the large bowel and may proceed to involve all of the large bowel. And because of the mucosal inflammation and ulceration, uh, patients experience usually bloody diarrhea, cramping, and a number of extra intestinal manifestations such as fatigue, arthralgias, joint aches, and uh, many other uh, difficult issues to deal with. What's the current treatment landscape for this condition? You know, historically, we had uh, very conventional agents like the 5 salicylates, which do work for mild to moderately severe disease for a proportion of patients. But many patients progress to need a course or more of corticosteroids. And once that occurs, uh, their trajectory of their disease is often not very good and uh, a relatively high proportion of requiring total proctocolectomy and a J-pouch um, if they don't respond. Mm-hmm. In the last few decades, we've had the anti-TNF antibodies, uh, which clearly revolutionized the treatment of patients with ulcerative colitis and are quite effective, but not uniformly for everyone. And even more recently, we have the addition of, uh, of vetalizumab, an anti-alpha-4 beta-7 integrin antibody, so another biologic agent, as well as eustachinumab, which is an anti-IL-12 and 23 antibody. And finally, we have uh, JAK inhibitor, uh, which is tofacitinib, which is used only for patients refractory to anti-TNF antibodies. Mm-hmm. And very, very recently, just in the last year, we have the, the approval of an oral medication, which is an S1P1 receptor modulator. Um, that's a class of agents that has been used in multiple sclerosis, but this is uh, this drug, Gozanamod, is the first one approved for use in ulcerative colitis. So we have an array of different treatments, mm-hmm. um, but the issue is any one of these treatments will not treat 100% of patients. So we still have patients who are refractory to any number of these therapies. Uh, is that a, a high number of such patients? Is, is there a huge unmet need in that area? There, there is a large unmet need in, in two respects. One is that We see that some patients, while they may initially respond, there there can be gradual loss of response Mm -hmm. to a single agent over time. And even beyond that, we have uh, a substantial number of patients who don't respond to any one of these agents as a primary therapy. So it's primary non-response and secondary loss of response. And then most difficult, we have people who are refractory to multiple serial agents who then have no recourse other than a total proctocolectomy. As lead investigator on the Vega Phase 2A study, give us some insight into the why of this study and some of the major findings. Yeah, the, the why of this study is a general sense in the field that we're seeing the plateauing of efficacy of single agents, that there's, again, a proportion of patients who we just cannot touch with one agent or who over time, lose response. In other fields, like infectious disease and in cancer, we've seen successful combinations of therapy overcome therapeutic plateaus. So there is a desire to try that in IBD as well to overcome our therapeutic plateau. In addition to that, we have some preclinical information which suggests that the specific combination of drugs that were studied in Vega might be effective, namely 
We have gisulcumab, which is an anti-IL-23 antibody being studied in ulcerative colitis and in Crohn's disease, and golimumab, which is an approved TNF-alpha antagonist uh, that is approved in ulcerative colitis. Um, those two agents, when you study them, uh, these two different kinds of agents in an animal model, a mouse model of colitis, there seems to be synergistic or at least additive efficacy. And if you look in silico at what you achieve uh, in expression arrays by blocking both TNF and IL-23, you see that the effect is synergistic, including on a number of different networks that either either one of the single therapies don't actually hit, but yet might be important for the treatment of IBD. So those are all the whys. And, you know, the what was a very, in concept, simple study, but really this study was the first uh, of its kind to combine two different biologic agents as a potential novel way of treating ulcerative colitis. So basically you had a one-to-one randomization of patients to standard golimumab monotherapy, that's the anti-TNF, the sulcumab monotherapy, uh, that's the anti-IL-23, or to the combination of both of them. And then patients were followed out to week 12, and the primary endpoint was clinical response, but we also looked at a number of other important clinical outcomes and, of course, safety. So these patients were naive to anti-TNF uh, as well as to ustekinumab, which is a anti-IL-12 and 23 antibody. And uh, what we can say is that the study achieved its primary endpoint of superior clinical response of the combination therapy of golimumab and gisulcumab when compared to either monotherapy arm. And you had 83% of patients achieving clinical response at week 12 with golimumab Mm -hmm. just 61% and with gisulcumab uh, 75% approximately. But as you look at more and more stringent outcomes like clinical remission and endoscopic improvement, you can see that there's um, almost a doubling of the of the endoscopic improvement rate, and you see um, quite a bit more benefit in achieving clinical remission at week 12, combination therapy achieving that in a third of patients, and for each of the monotherapies, only about one in five patients. Uh, And then finally, um, a very rigorous endpoint is um, a composite outcome of histologic remission and endoscopic improvement. So we have microscopic improvement and macroscopic endoscopic improvement in the same patient, very tough to achieve. And that was done with combination therapy in 40.8% of patients, with golimumab only 15.3%, and with gisulcumab alone only 26.8%. And finally, the combination at least over 12 weeks appeared to be safe. So this gives you more than a hint that the combination of Golimumab and gisulcumab, anti-TNF biologic agent and an anti-IL-23 biologic agent, has some additive value in efficacy and appears in the short term to be safe. Is there anything that you'd like to add for our listeners? Yes. Well, I I think it's going to be important to see if these results uh, hold out in the longer term as we continue to follow these patients on combinations. There is a maintenance uh, phase, which really reverts to monotherapy with either the anti-TNF or with gisulcumab, um, and to see how that plays out over time. I think it's more broadly important for the field because it brings a new concept of combining agents that have synergy or additive value to see if we can overcome this therapeutic plateau, not just for ulcerative colitis, but also for Crohn's disease, the other major form of IBD. So time will tell in future studies, which are planned, whether uh, this uh, specific combination is going to prove to be safe and beneficial. Well, I appreciate you lending us some more of your time. Thanks so much for returning, Dr. Sands. It's been a pleasure speaking with you as always. I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Thanks so much, Neil. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with returning guest, Dr. Bruce Sands. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com health professional radio.